Uh, so that was my first book uh, the, based on my graduate dissertation, and uh, it's a history of the Washington Metro, um, which uh, opened up in 1976, uh, so turning 45 this year. And um, if people know Washington, it's certainly one of the most distinctive transit systems in the world. Uh, it's also had uh, some troubles of late with maintenance and finances, like every other transit system in the United States. But it really was a, a pretty bold effort in the 1960s to say, we're not going to put all of our money in highways. We're going to try to give Americans some choice about how to get around. Well, I was certainly a beneficiary when I was living in, in Washington after after college. Let me uh, welcome everyone. Um, I am Lee Wright, the founder of History Camp. I'm your Boston, and with me in Virginia is... Hi, I'm Carrie Lund, the director of The Pursuit of History, the nonprofit that brings these discussions to you every Thursday night. Tonight, we are excited to have Zachary M. Schrag joining us. Zach is the author of The Great Society Subway, A History of the Washington Metro that we were just talking about. Ethical Imperialism, Institutional Review Boards, and the Social Sciences, and the Princeton Guide to Historical Research. He has received grants and fellowships from the National Science Foundation, the Gerald Ford Foundation, and the Library of Congress, and has been awarded the Society for American City and Regional Planning History's John Reps Prize. He is the director of the Master's Program of, in History at George Mason University. Tonight, we'll be discussing his new book, The Fires of Philadelphia, Citizen Soldiers, Nativists, and the 1844 Riots Over the Soul of a Nation. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Zach. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So why don't we start and kind of set the stage? Uh, this is a, a, a particular incident that people may not be familiar with. Why don't you give people a sense of what was going on at the country at the time, the mood, and, and perhaps some of the trends leading up to it? Uh, so my book is set in 1844. Um, pretty much everything in the book takes place within that single year. Obviously, there are some you know, incidents leading up to that. And uh, that was a, a pretty chaotic and troubling time to be an American. You really didn't know uh, even where the country began and ended. Uh, this was right when Americans were debating whether Texas, which had uh, broken off from Mexico by American colonists, whether Texas should be brought into the Union, uh, whether there should be another war with Britain over the Oregon boundary. People you know, didn't know the basic boundaries of the country. Uh, people didn't really know uh, some of the laws of the country. So the founding generation had, had passed. Uh, James Madison dies in 1836, and Americans are trying to figure out um, what do we do now. And, and one of the new inventions they create is the political party. Uh, there had been Federalists and Republicans before, but the real two-party system, uh, something like what we know today, is much more a product of the Jacksonian period. So it's not in the Constitution. They were making that up as they went along. Uh, you had uh, debates about whether Indians could be included, and unfortunately, the answer in many cases was no, and uh, most of the Native peoples east of the Mississippi were dispossessed of their lands. Uh, you had women. Uh, demanding rights and maybe even the vote. You had Mormons creating a new religion and getting into battles in Missouri and Illinois. Uh, and then you had immigrants um, from lots of different places in Europe, but most of all from Ireland, uh, who were coming primarily to the East Coast cities and uh, staying there. They, they, Unlike some of the other groups, they didn't have the money to move west and start far farms. So many of them are becoming up a big part of the population of the big East Coast cities like Baltimore, New York, and Philadelphia. And where does this fall in terms of the potato famine and, and that exodus from, from Ireland? So, uh, right, so if you go to Philadelphia now, there's this really fascinating memorial to the victims of the Great Hunger. Uh, that comes a little bit later. Okay. Um, ironically enough, 1844 is the last year the potato crop is good. Um, it's, it's really, um, by the fall of 1844, you're already seeing the blight of the United States, and then it hits Ireland. But Ireland was already poor before the famine. The reason the famine is so destructive is that people had lost a lot of other forms of food. They weren't eating so many vegetables or meat or dairy. Uh, they had been reduced to eating potatoes, which was already pretty poor. So uh, Ireland's population had, had grown quite a bit, and the economy had not kept pace. So you had a lot of people in Ireland looking to leave. Uh, some go to England some go to Canada, and many come to the United States. Economic migration, essentially? 
Uh, primarily. Uh, certainly, um, Irish uh, Catholics were hoping for more political and religious freedom as well, um, but they had achieved some of that in 1829 um, due to the Emancipation Act in the United Kingdom. So it was primarily economic um, reasons that led people to leave Ireland and look for a better future elsewhere. Now, we're going to focus on Philadelphia, but were the same clashes that we're going to talk about taking place at, in it, any of the other large East Coast cities? Uh, they were. And, and so you see, again, this out movement from Ireland and large numbers of Irish people showing up, um, not only, again, in the East Coast, but also um, in Liverpool, for example, in Montreal, um, in other parts of the British Empire, and uh, to some extent later on in Midwestern cities in Kentucky or Ohio. Um, and again, it's, it's, the numbers are just so much greater. Um, Oscar Handlin many years ago wrote a, wrote a great book called Boston's Immigrants, where he just contrasts you know, the relatively small numbers of French or Germans to the, the very large numbers of Irish who really uh, pose a greater challenge to the status quo than did previous immigrant groups, simply because of their numbers. Sure. Uh, and at this point in our nation's history, there was um, wide open immigration, correct? There, were no, there was no at attempt at uh, numbers or anything like that. Is that correct? It's almost correct. Uh, there's a, a great book, recent book out um, called Expelling the Poor uh, that shows how individual states, not the federal government, but individual states could use poor laws to say that people who were paupers could not come in, whether from other countries or other states. So uh, New York and Massachusetts in particular used these to try to keep out the Irish. Uh, for the most part, Pennsylvania did not. Um, if, if you came, uh, you could settle. If you were white and over 21, you could get citizenship in five years. Um, and that was regardless of a property requirement. Okay. All right. So take us to Philadelphia. We've talked about kind of the larger context in the nation. What does Philadelphia look like as this as there's this coming surge in population? Uh, so um, I don't know if you have the, the map I sent earlier, but um, today Philadelphia um, is a, a pretty large uh, county. It's over 150 square miles. Um, that still was Philadelphia County in the 1840s. But the city of Philadelphia itself was just a fairly thin strip, two square miles in the middle, as founded by William Penn in the 17th century. And if you can see that map, uh, his idea was that Philadelphia would stretch from the Delaware River on the east, which had connections to the Atlantic Ocean, to the Schuylkill River on the west, which had connections inland. But instead, uh, the population moved north and south up along the Delaware River. And that's the sort of shaded area on the map. And so it expanded past the boundaries of Philadelphia City into other parts of Philadelphia County. And eventually, uh, these parts got their own governments. The most populous ones became what were known as districts, which were essentially mini cities. And these were some of the most populous urban areas in the United States. They actually show up separately on census counts in the top 15. Uh, so up in the Northeast, you have the district of Kensington where you have uh, shipbuilding and wharves along the river and then more textile production uh, further inland. And in the southeast, you have the district of Southwark, which has the U.S. Navy Yard and a lot of, again, maritime activity going on there, um, as well as some manufacturing. So uh, Philadelphia City itself, that's where the rich people live. That's where the Whigs are. That's where the kind of you know, Independence Hall, if you think about that sort of tourist part of Philadelphia, and then north and south, you have these more industrial suburbs where things are a good bit wilder and uh, the government can't really reach so far. And, and were those um, suburbs more, uh, we'd find more immigrants there? And, and what was the previous kind of wave of immigration before then the, the Irish coming? So you had Irish going back uh, to the 17th century and, and certainly throughout uh, the 18th century. Uh, most of those were Protestant Irish, though. And so, you know, one of the big differences is after the War of 1812, uh, that changes to a predominantly Catholic immigrant stream. And, you know, this is something that Americans, you know, if you think about Irish Americans, you probably think about Catholics. But of course, we've had a, a Protestant Irish population, again, going back centuries. 
Um, you also had, of course, Germans, you know, the famous Pennsylvania Dutch, not so much in Philadelphia, but certainly uh, many uh, nearby. Um, and you have Germantown, um, Pennsylvania, which was then its own place, now part of uh, the city of Philadelphia. Um, and you had Welsh and you had um, some French. Uh, so, so, and then, you know, of course, many Im English immigrants, uh, many of them Quakers going back to the founding of the colony, uh, but many of other denominations as well. So it's a pretty big mix, um, much more mixed than say New England, uh, the middle colonies, New York, Philadelphia, you know, traditionally were more welcoming to immigrants and had a uh, more diverse population. And, you know, for a while that works. There were always some tensions uh, between different religious groups, between different ethnic groups, um, and then quite a bit of tension over racial groups. And, you know, um, certainly uh, attacks on African-American communities as well as abolitionists. Um, but, you know, into the 1830s, the Irish uh, were largely accepted and were making uh, inroads into uh, the economy, into government, uh, into the political parties. Um, so it seemed for a while that they might just, uh, you know, assimilate and become part of the um, greater project of Philadelphia and Pennsylvania. So what happened and what was the spark then that, that started these series of events? Um, so it's, it's a great question. You know, how do we go from that relatively stable situation to more competition? And a few things are going on. Um, one is that the economy tanks. Um, in 1837, we have what we now know as the Panic of 1837, which I think is a little misleading. It makes it sound like it was one year. It was actually a multi-year depression that threw a lot of people out of work um, or reduced their wages. And uh, so that makes you know the new immigrant coming off the ship willing to work for less seem more of a threat. So that, that was certainly part of it. Um, another part of it was religious anxiety. And again, I brought up, you know, Liverpool and Montreal as before. And this, this again, is part of what's going on with, uh, in 1829, the United Kingdom gives some legal rights to Catholics who had been denied them for centuries. And I think this creates something of a backlash, a panic about Catholic voters, not only in the United Kingdom, but also in the United States, where people like Samuel Morse, who was later famous for inventing the telegraph, uh, decide that they're going to be victims of some kind of Catholic conspiracy. They think that Catholics uh, can't be good independent citizens. They'll listen to their priest. They, own, they owe allegiance to the Pope, who was technically a foreign monarch. And so you see this wave of anti-Catholicism uh, starting in the 1830s in the United States, uh, really spreading out from New York, but it, it shows up you know, anywhere from Boston all the way down to Louisiana. Um, so uh, you've got economic anxiety, you've got uh, religious anxiety, and then the third ingredient is uh, the politics. So again, I mentioned that you have these two relatively new parties, the Democrats, those are pretty much everyone who likes Andrew Jackson, and the Whigs, people who don't like Andrew Jackson, uh, developing into political parties, but those are both very new. The Whigs only show up around 1834 or so. And so other people say, maybe we can invent some other parties. Maybe we'll have an abolitionist party. Maybe we'll have a Mormon party. Maybe we'll have a nativist party, which is going to be a party that says it's too easy to get citizenship and these immigrants should have to wait 21 years to become citizens. Um, and they shouldn't get government jobs and they certainly shouldn't hold high political office. And so I think the fact that 1844 is an election year is quite significant. Uh, in April of 1844, a nativist wins the election to be mayor of New York, and that makes Philadelphia nativists see great opportunities to organize their own party. And let's let's play this on forward to these uh, to these clashes. Um, I, I believe at one point uh, I we we talked kind of in the lead up to this this idea that certain conflicts like this kind of come in waves. Um, so I think we have a sense maybe of what may be fueling kind of this wave. What sets it off and turns it into physical violence? So one of the things to know about riots is that there are very fine, often invisible lines between a parade or a protest or a political rally, some kind of not necessarily violent, but physical manifestation of people are in the streets saying, this is who we are, this is what we believe. 
Uh, and that turning with a little spark into violence. It can be someone throws a brick through a window and the sound of breaking glass, or it can be someone pulls out a gun, right? So that instead of people sort of shoving each other, now there's actually the threat of death. Um, a little thing can go wrong. And so this is what happens on May 6th of 1844, when a bunch of nativists, and it's a very hard word to say, but a, a tongue twister there, a bunch of nativists are in the third ward of Kensington, a predominantly Irish Catholic neighborhood, giving, getting ready to give their speeches. And, and they're, they're expecting hecklers. They're expecting people who are going to maybe show up and throw dirt, but they're not expecting real violence. And then something terrible goes wrong. It starts to rain, like a really bad rain. I mean, you get descriptions of awnings being torn off of buildings and you know people being knocked down. So there's wind and there's rain. And they say, oh, we, we've got a, a new plan. Uh, we, we're going to run for shelter. And the nearest shelter that they see is a market house, which is turns out to be a bad place to go because it's full of Irish Catholic workers who regard that market house as kind of their headquarters. So this turns into a big fist fight between nativists and the local Catholics. Someone pulls out a gun. It's, you know, lots of competing testimony about who fired the first shot. Uh, they shoot an Irish Catholic firefighter in the face. He was trying to make peace. He, he survives. But then this turns into a much broader melee. And a lot of the Irish Catholics who live nearby run home and, and get whatever weapons they have, whereas the nativists are kind of stuck with whatever rocks and bricks they can pick up off the street. So that first day of violence, you have uh, several Protestants who are, are shot by the Catholics, uh, some of them fatally. Um, and uh, this is pretty shocking to a city that you know had a, had a number of riots and had a brawls almost every weekend, but nothing like this. They were already pretty shocked. The next day, Tuesday, May 7th, it gets even worse. There's a big meeting down at Independence Hall. Some of the more senior people are saying, hey, maybe we should take a time out. Uh, we can talk on Thursday, right? Let's take a 48 hour or a 72 hour break. And instead the hotheads take over the meeting and they say, let's march back to Kensington. And this turns out to create another battle, more gunfire, this time both sides, because now the Protestants knew to bring their guns and more people are killed and some fires are set. And then on the third day of the riding, the militia is there, it kind of calms down the gunfire, but they're having trouble. There just aren't enough of them to spot every teenager with a match. And so the Protestants set fire to a number of Catholic institutions, including two churches that are just gutted along with the priest's house and, and the, the other things nearby. And this, again, just escalates things to a, thing, to a level that people are not used to. They're not used to seeing churches, especially white people's churches, uh, burned to the ground. Uh, whatever they may think about Catholicism, uh, a lot of most Pennsylvanians just see that as a step too far. And this makes international news. Uh, again, not too many people are killed. It's about a dozen people killed. But uh, the act of burning down the churches um, really shocks people. And, and that, by the way, is the cover of the book, is one of those churches burning. Um, and so that's the first wave. There's three days of fighting in uh, Kensington, uh, mostly Protestants dead, but two Catholic churches are burned. Then there's a bit of peace. It's not a super peaceful. People are looking at each other. Uh, nuns are being insulted in the streets, right? A lot of insults being thrown. But they make it through the rest of May and June in some kind of order. But while this is, go while this is going on, the nativists are planning a massive July 4th parade. And everyone thinks, oh, this is going to be really bad. They're going to you know, march through the Catholic neighborhoods with their banners and their insults. And it's going to start another wave of rioting. And it almost seems like they avoid that. They make it through July 4th, through the fireworks, everything, without anyone dying. And they're just congratulating each other and say, hey, you know, we're, it's over. And then it turns out that on July 5th, they find out that a Catholic priest in Southwark, down to the south of Philadelphia, had filled his church with guns in preparation for the parade because he thought he was going to be attacked. And then Protestants hear about this, they think, oh, He's going to murder us. They besiege his church. And this starts a second round of violence. This time, instead of Catholics versus Protestants, it's the nativists versus the militia who come in to defend this church. They've already lost two. They don't want to lose a third Catholic church. 
And that starts a full scale battle uh, with cavalry, cannon on both sides, uh, many more dead uh, before it's all over. So talk to us about the militia. Um, to what extent were there metropolitan police? And in your description a minute ago with cannon on both sides, that seems pretty incredible. Uh, how do how do um, regular citizens end up with, with cannon that they bring then to this conflict? Yeah, so um, traditionally Americans were did not want a permanent force. They're uh, traditionally against a standing army and against a professional police. And that meant everything was supposed to be done by volunteers. If uh, you have a relatively minor uh, crime or fight, the sheriff goes out, taps you on the shoulder, now you're in his posse, you pin a little paper badge on your coat, he hands you a stick or maybe a gun, and you go out and you know, you're a police officer for you know, several hours until he dismisses you. And then if it's beyond what the sheriff can handle, theoretically, there's this militia, which is every able-bodied white man who's supposed to be proficient in arms. Um, none of, neither of these systems really works as advertised. Uh, the posse system works a little bit, um, but it begins to break down as American cities get bigger in the 1830s, the violence gets more intense and also more frequent, and fewer people are going to, you know, when they see the sheriff coming, they, they remember they have an errand in the other direction, right? So the posse system is breaking down. And then the militia system, this idea that every able-bodied man is going to be in the militia, no one wants to do that. That's like much worse than jury duty. They avoid it. They get doctor's notes. They show up holding a broomstick instead of a gun. That doesn't work. What does work a little bit is the volunteer militia, which is much more like today's National Guard, where these are men who really want to be there. They're not doing compulsory service. They've volunteered for this. They've got nice uniforms. They have fancy parties, balls where they do dancing, they do drill, they do target practice, all the rest. And it turns out that if you call them out to riot duty, much of the time they will show up. Not all the time, and that's part of the problem, but much of the time they'll say, okay, you know, I signed up for this, I'll do it. What they really want to do is fight off, you know, European invaders. The British had come in, you know, 1775, they'd come again in 1814. Uh, that's what the militia really wants to do. But if you call them out for riot duty, they're sort of willing to do it. And that's what eventually they do in 1844. So they're basically a bunch of volunteers who are there, uh, who, who signed up to do one thing and are grudgingly willing to do something else. Oh, and then, you know, in terms of armaments, they're all equipped to fight a European army, right? Cavalry, infantry, uh, artillery. In terms of the rioters, uh, they'll grab whatever is nearby. And in the 1840s, if you're near a river, well, there are ships and some of those ships if they're sailing on the Atlantic, they, they probably don't have cannon anymore. They're pretty much uh, gotten rid of Atlantic piracy. But if they're sailing to China, well, they're going to have some cannon on them to uh, repel any pirates they meet on the way. So uh, there are ships and there are shipyards down in Southwark. And if you get enough teenagers together, uh, they can pull a cannon off a ship. And uh, you can buy gunpowder at the corner store. It's pretty hard to get cannon balls. But you can just pack that cannon with, uh, you know, old tools, with beer bottles, whatever you find in the street. It's going to come out the end of that cannon and uh, potentially kill the people you're aiming at. Well, so uh, let's go back. We had we had July 4th. We, had, we escaped incident. Uh, and, and then a, a precautionary measure from the 4th turns into an inflammatory uh, incendiary uh, moment on the on the fifth in terms of reaction to it. Uh, what happened from there? So um, on the fifth, you have again the sort of discovery of the weapons. Uh, the sheriff, a uh, guy named Morden McMichael, comes down from Philadelphia City. Uh, it's not at all clear what the the legality of these weapons are. That would be disputed later. Um, most people actually think that you know, if you want to put weapons in your church, that, that that's your business. Um, the Pennsylvania Constitution had a right to bear arms that was more extensive than the federal one. And again, these churches had been threatened. It, it actually seemed like a good idea maybe to have an armed guard. But he says no. This is too inflammatory. He, he gets all the weapons out of the church, but then. You know, he sees the, the point of the priest that um, maybe people are going to attack this church. So when a local militia company comes by, local militia captain says, hey, do you want me to guard the church for you? The sheriff is like, yeah, sure. 
So uh, now they're a militia in the church. Um, they are there uh, the next day. Another mob forms. They're kind of threatening the church. And uh, Brigadier General Cadwallader, who's the commander of the Philadelphia city troops, uh, he comes down himself and uh, people are throwing bottles at him. They're cursing him. Uh, and it comes very close to gunfire there. He actually orders his troops uh, to fire and they get ready. They're just waiting for the order. And then a man rushes out in front of them and says, no, no, don't shoot. And he puts his body in front of the guns. And that's a, a former congressman named Charles Naylor, who um, was friends with the sheriff. Uh, we can argue about his motives. Was he trying to protect the nativists? Was he just trying to protect peace? But Cadwallader is, is furious at him, even though he's saved a bunch of people's lives. He orders him locked up in the church. And this was, a, in retrospect, a terrible decision because it just makes everyone around even angrier at this Catholic church in their neighborhood that now it's being used to imprison Protestants. And worse still, in retrospect, uh, some of the troops that Kidwaller puts there to guard Naylor are militia, uh, the Montgomery Hibernia Greens. So a group of Irish Catholic militia are in the Catholic church holding a Protestant hostage uh, is how the local Protestants perceive it. And there are other prisoners as well. And this is just sort of tapped into centuries of Protestant uh, anxiety about Catholic churches and dungeons and, and all the rest. So this creates a third mob. This is uh, by Sunday, July 7th. This is when they get their hands on these cannon. They're actually bombarding the church with Nailer in it. Seems a little counterproductive, but that's what they do. They eventually uh, chase the militia out chase them through the streets, uh, brutally injuring one of them, and uh, hold the church. And when Cadwallader hears about this and confers with his colonels and with his commanding general, they decide that this is just unacceptable. They're going to march every available soldier in Philadelphia down to retake this church. Uh, they go down there, they clear the street, and again, this is where you know that thin line gets crossed. Um, there's some pushing, there's some shoving, Someone throws a brick. Uh, there are many bricks thrown, but the one that really matters is one that hits a militia captain. He goes down flat on his face, and his troops fire uh, to protect their captain or at least avenge him if he's actually already been killed. He's, he's not killed, but they don't know that. Um, and this, you know, again, is the first blood of July. Well, not the first blood of July, but the first fatalities of July. Um, and that leads, you know, the, the crowd leaves, but they say, we'll be back. They go get some more cannon, and as night falls, Kedwaller and his troops are surrounded in hostile territory with, you know, everyone around them uh, vowing to avenge the dead. It's dark. Uh, they're not going to make it back to Philadelphia City. Uh, even if they did, it would mean abandoning the, um, the church that they came down to save. So instead, they dig in, and that's when the battle really gets intense. How does all of this um, take us forward? Then give us a sense, and and I, I want to encourage people to read the book because yeah. I know that we're you're giving kind of the the high points here. Um, how long does this last, and and what finally brings it to a, the 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 this intense violence to a close? And then what are the ramifications? It sounds like there were also uh, what trials or investigations after these events. Yeah. So. Uh what brings the immediate violence to the close is the importation of troops from throughout Eastern Pennsylvania. Um, there are some requests for federal troops. Uh, you know, there are some Marines at the Navy Yard, but really, um, you know, messengers are going out to other counties, to Lancaster, uh, Harrisburg, and all of these cities are sending in their troops until there are thousands of troops and Philadelphia's in martial law. And, you know, there are curfews, all the rest. Um, so that calms things down enough uh, for people to calm down. And then, uh, you know, I think what really calms things down, and this is, you know, not the ending I would want, but, you know, the ending you get, is that the nativists uh, turn to electoral politics. Again, 1844 is an election year. 
you had, you know, in the 1840s, there were elections in many different months of the year. So you had one round in, in May, uh, you'd have another round of local elections in October that included the congressional elections, and then the presidential election in November. And the nativists, uh, to my dismay, do very well in the October elections. Uh, I think the violence actually helped motivate their followers. They said, oh, this, this is really important. Um, you know, we hadn't realized what a threat the Irish were until all these people started dying. And so they, uh, they don't win all the elections, but they win a lot of key ones. They almost win the mayoralty of Philadelphia. And I think at that point, they had kind of proved their point that this was a central issue for Philadelphia, for Pennsylvania, and it was worth creating an entirely new party, variously called the American Republican or the Native American Party, to reduce the rights of immigrants. Um, so having gotten that party going, I think they felt less need to prove themselves in the streets in violence. Um, and then, you know, in the long term, as you mentioned, you have the irony of this is, uh, this, the potato famine starts just a couple of years later. And by 1846, 1847, there are more Irish Catholics arriving in Philadelphia than anyone could have imagined in 1844. That makes some of this moot, right? They're not gonna keep the Irish away after that. But there are continuing battles over Irish political power that go well into the 19th century. And, you know, to some extent, up you could say it's the election of John F. Kennedy in 1960. Yeah, you know, those, th th those questions he was asked, I believe, right? Uh, kind of uh, specifically about kind of who he would answer to or whatever. I don't remember the exact question, but a surprising question and that, that, you know, we want, one doesn't think of. Anyway, um, but did did this did these events in Philadelphia did these lead to any sort of uh, again kind of copycat events in other in other cities in other large cities? So there is a, a national nativist movement in the 1840s. Uh, it it kind of uh, fizzles out by the late 1840s. It's very hard to create a third party in the United States just based on the constitutional system because if you've got you know four seats in Congress or six seats in Congress, what good does that do you um, if you're trying to get jobs for your supporters or getting legislation through? Um, that said, uh, by the 1850s, you have a resurgent nativist movement uh, known as the Know Nothings. Um, it doesn't have four seats in Congress. I think it has dozens or maybe even hundreds of seats in Congress. It, it, it becomes a really stronger movement and you have renewed violence, uh, especially in the mid 1850s. And, and there are more attacks on Catholic churches. Um, and it's not exactly the same movement. Um, the term know nothing refers to the secrecy, uh, the kind of fraternal lodge elements of the movement where there are passwords and special uniforms um, that were much less common in 1844. But certainly uh, some of the same people who were involved in 1844 helped build that movement in the 1850s and others drew inspiration uh, from the 1840s. So I think you can see in Philadelphia in 1844, the beginning of one of the most successful third party movements uh, in the United States in the 1850s. That eventually gets pulled in primarily into the Republican Party. And that's true in Pennsylvania as well. A lot of nativists end up as members of the Republican Party. And there's that nativist stream in the Republican Party that persists. By no means were all Republicans nativists. Abraham Lincoln was not. Uh, William Seward was not. But many were, and they shaped some of the policies that that party developed. I'm going to go back to one other uh, question before we go to questions from the audience. Uh, you talked about the, the view of some that uh, uh, immigrants should be here 21 years, perhaps, before they'd have the right to vote, uh, that they shouldn't hold certain office and so on. Uh, what happened to those sorts of laws uh, when the nativists, kind of, you know, kind of swept the elections? Did you see those sorts of things being enacted? So this was, you know, part of the, uh, the fraud that the nativists perpetrated, which was, um, that was a federal law, the five year for voting. And there's nothing the Philadelphia Council or, you know, the uh, Southwark Board of Commissioners could do to change immigration law. So, you know, they were promising that they would, um, you know, work to change the citizenship law, but they had no real levers to do that. Um, and certainly not the numbers in Congress. So immigration law did not change. Um, 
you know, later, of course, in the 1880s with Chinese exclusion, that's when you get the beginning of federal immigration law. Uh, what did change were some of the uh, patronage jobs. Um, so, you know, the, you have fights over who's going to dig the culvert, who's going to get the contract to extend the wharf, and then, of course, uh, fights over who's going to join the police force. Because after the riots, Philadelphians think, oh, maybe we do want a professional police force. There are lots of debates. It's kind of a, a gradual thing. But by the 1850s, they have one. And there are fights about, uh, you know, first, it's going to be all native born. Then the Democrats, when they say, no, no, we're going to hire lots of Irish cops. And that's how the, you know, stereotype of the Irish cop gets going is by Democrats in both New York and Philadelphia filling up their police forces um, in part to win the votes of Irish immigrants who can, in fact, vote uh, thanks to that five-year rule. Um, so in that sense, there's a lot of debate over um, jobs. Uh, there's also debates over schools. And this was part of the story I didn't get to before, is at the time, the public schools were still a relatively new institution. One of the things that hadn't been decided was whether uh, the children should have religious instruction. Uh, for the most part, the founders of American public schools said no, you know, they can learn that at their churches, but they seemed to think they could not have a proper school without a Bible in it. And then the question is, do you want the Protestant King James, the Catholic Douay, something else? And there are big debates over that. That continues after the 1844 riots. Uh, what the Catholic clergy want is a separate system of parochial schools. Uh, it takes them decades to build it up in any numbers. Um, but of course, you know, eventually they build a very extensive system of Catholic parochial schools in Philadelphia and elsewhere. And, you know, those debates over what to teach our children um, certainly continue for many decades sure. after the 1840s. Sure. Uh, well, this is this has been a great uh, kind of overview of of this event, um, Carrie. What what questions do we have? All right. One question is: Did the posse system break down because men didn't want to publicly take sides against neighbors? Was that part of the problem? So I think a bigger problem was men didn't want to get bashed in the head with rocks. Um, so, you know, again, you know, it's one thing, the, the way it's sort of supposed to work is the posse shows up and everyone says, oh, you got me, um, and, you know, submit to arrest. But, um, thing, you know, American cities were just getting more and more violent in the 1830s, and there's, there are a series of strikes in the 1830s and 1840s in Philadelphia, and there's one in particular, I mean, I, I really wish I had a video of this, where the sheriff, a young man in his 20s, is, you know, it's this classic scene where he's just rushing ahead. He thinks he has the posse behind him. He looks behind him and they're just all gone. Like he is out there alone with a bunch of angry um, strikers and they, they beat him senseless. I mean, they, they don't kill him, but you know, back in the day, the best emergency medicine was still leeches and he had like a hundred leeches applied to his wounds. And so no one, you know, no one wanted to go into that uh, with just a, a paper badge and a wooden stick. Um, and, you know, I don't blame them. It's not something I'd really look forward to in an afternoon myself. So I, I think the, it just, the violence overtook what uh, you could really expect a volunteer posse to do. All right. Okay. And uh, were most of the rioters teenagers or young folks? Oh, yes. Uh, you know, the, and that's a classic. You see this across cultures, um, different periods. Um, if you want someone to, again, do something kind of violent and stupid, look for a 19-year-old, 19-year-old um, male. Uh, they were called half-grown boys at the time because the, the age of adulthood was 21. They didn't have the word teenagers, but a half-grown boy was 16 to 20, um, brave, stupid, energetic. And uh, they're the ones who are doing most of the fighting on, on both sides or all the sides. I mean, they're in the militia, they're uh, Catholics, they're Protestants. Um, part of the problem with riot control in the 1840s and ever since is that a typical crowd, you might have a very large number of people who are pretty peaceful, right? They're just there to be out in the street, make themselves you know, visible, show what they believe in. A smaller number is gonna be looting and burning and breaking windows. Uh, and then a smaller number than that is going to be willing to physically fight other people. To, to damn, And uh, if you come in as the militia or the police or the posse and you've got this mass, how do you pick out the few who are throwing the rocks from the much larger number of people who uh, are not? 
And so when, uh, you know, you mentioned the mass arrest, you know, people are picked up off the street, they get arrested, they, oh, oh I was just there watching. I'm a bystander. I just happened to be, you know, right at the corner where all the fighting was going on. And it's very hard to prosecute those people because, you know, they did not have video. Um, uh, so it, and so it's, it's, it's very challenging from a law enforcement point of view what to do when you have this mixture. But absolutely, the people who got killed, the people who were nabbed for violence, uh, overwhelmingly, uh, I would say 20, 16 to 22 uh, would be the key age for that kind of brawling. Okay, they are invincible at that age, so it makes yeah. sense. <laughs> All right, um, what resources did you use when you were doing your research? So um, a lot of this comes from newspapers. Uh, you had, at the time, there were something like 18 daily newspapers in Philadelphia and some weeklies and some bi-weeklies and some monthlies. Uh, not all of those have survived. Uh, there's one, you know, the, the Irish Citizen, which I would have loved to have read, but not a single issue of that survives. Uh, others are, are well preserved. Uh, some of them you can get, you know, on um, online these days uh, through some of these subscription services. Some of them I was going to the microfilm. Some of them I had to go to libraries and actually very gently turn those pages of 175 year old paper um, because they've never even been microfilmed. Um, and they, the wonderful thing is they have different loyalties. So you've got Democratic newspapers, you've got Whig newspapers, you've got neutral newspapers, you've got native newspapers, um, you have Catholic newspapers, Presbyterian newspapers, there's a militia newspaper. So each one of them would give me a little different piece of the puzzle, uh, depending on its editorial stance and what they thought people were interested in. Um, there are some diaries. Uh, the best of all is uh, an artillery colonel who works under Kidwaller named Augustus Pleasanton wonderful diary up at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Uh, not only is he a really good observer and writer who you know, gives dialogue and all kinds of things that, that people said to him, uh, but he also has beautiful handwriting, which I really appreciate. Uh, Cadwaller mixed some of them absolutely terrible. The Sheriff McMichael, worst of all. Um, you have uh, some letters, some you know, manuscript. Uh, Cadwallader has a collection up in, in Pennsylvania. Uh, there's some letters that have survived. Uh, you mentioned the trials, right? So you have these trials for murder because you know, about two dozen people were killed. And so you have extensive testimony that is reported more or less verbatim in the newspapers. And one of the wonderful things about that is it allows me to put a lot of dialogue in the book. You know, I have, you know, so-and-so said such and such. I didn't make that up. No, that's right there in the trial transcript. You know, maybe the witness made it up, but you know, I have reason to believe that someone said "fire and be damned," or you know, "you dare not fire." You know, some of these um, great sentences leaping off the page. Um, there's some visual evidence. Photography was in its infancy, but it was there, especially in Philadelphia, it's sort of city of science. So we have. Um, one fairly famous daguerreotype showing, you can't quite see the troops, you can see the horses, and you can see a bunch of boys like looking and like, ooh, soldiers. Oh, and then yes, we have a lithograph. Uh, there are various lithographs and woodcuts, uh, and this is one of the most famous, uh, done actually in New York City, but um, really a, a wonderful rendering of the Southbrook riots. You can kind of read it as a, a page of a comic book where it's not one thing happening all at once, but like little episodes. Um, but if you can see in the center, you have, again, these rioters. I don't know why they're wearing top hats, but they're firing pistols and, and muskets at the troops. Uh, the troops are very unhappy to be there. Uh, they don't want to really shoot their neighbors, but they don't want to be shot either. Uh, you have a man in front picking up bricks. And, you know, when, you, again, you think about these kind of rough suburbs of Philadelphia, there's always a building being put up or torn down. So there are plenty of bricks to be picked up. Uh, you have cannon firing. Probably can't see, but there are some sailors uh, firing that cannon, which makes sense, right? They would have come off the ships. Uh, in the upper left, you have the street light showing it's a nighttime battle, though by the end, all the street lights have been doused or shot out. And in the upper right, you see the church of St. Philip de Neri that the militia were defending um, through all of this. And then in the lower right, you have this woman and her children, uh, you know, because this is a neighborhood, right? These are people, and, and you have these wonderful, horrifying stories of, you know, people getting bullets through their windows, bullets ending up in their paneling, you know, trying to get the kids to the basement or the, uh, you know, old folks over the fence in the back alley, um, because this was an urban battle uh, in the middle of a place where people were living. Right. One of the very striking things I noticed 
was after the first riot, there had been all the fires. And of course, it's in a neighborhood. So several homes also burned down. And and someone said, well, there's 20 years work just gone like that because everything in his home was gone. It's quite striking. Um, okay, we have one more question from a viewer who would like to know um, if you can, oh, we have two more, hold on. <laughs> can you speak about how the city expanded after the riots? Yeah, that's, that's a great question because I, I mentioned that the city of Philadelphia was two square miles, more or less in 1844. And that was a real problem when the riots are taking place uh, in these districts outside of the boundaries. Because Philadelphia did have a small police force. Again, they weren't wearing uniforms of the way we'd imagine police force, but they had something. But they were legally unable to cross the street to the districts. Um, so what's now uh, South Street in Philadelphia, that was the southern boundary of the city. They, you know, the police officer, you know, he could see a crime in progress across the street. He had no jurisdiction there. So that's one of the reasons these... Um, districts became known as sort of places for gangs and vice and that kind of thing. So after the riots, and people had talked about it before, but especially after the riots, they said, this is kind of stupid. Um, we should have some kind of county-wide jurisdiction, so at least the police can cross the street. They do that, but that gets the ball rolling to a full consolidation. And in 1854, uh, what was then Philadelphia County, again, 150 plus square miles, becomes consolidated with the city of Philadelphia, and it remains that today. So the present boundaries of Philadelphia are created in 1854, um, and this is a precedent for other consolidations like New York City in 1898 or Miami-Dade, where it, it makes sense to have a jurisdiction that spans the metropolitan area. Obviously, metropolitan Philadelphia now goes you know, beyond the, the borders of Philadelphia County, but it's still, uh, you know, most of Philadelphia is in Philadelphia County, and that's due not exclusively, but in part to the riots and the feeling that uh, the city needed a better police force. Okay, thank you. Um, did you find that the windows in Catholic churches were higher than normal due to the destruction that was occurring? So you hear that story about the big cathedral um, that's up in the Northwest um, uh, now that was uh, created. So the, the bishop at the time is uh, Bishop uh, Francis Patrick Kenrick. He's later Archbishop of Baltimore. And he commissions that cathedral. And actually, the architect, one of the architects, Napoleon Lebrun, had done that smaller church that was attacked in Southwark, the Church of St. Philip. And uh, so, yeah, it doesn't have side windows. It's got clerestory windows way up high. And according to Lebrun, he did it because he wanted the light shining down as an effect. But um, there's the folklore that he, they did it that way so that in case there was another mob, they couldn't, they could use the cathedral as a fortress. There's lots of folklore about these riots. Uh, some of it on the Protestant side, some of it on the Catholic side. Um, and, you know, I, I tried to nail down what was true and what was not. Um, but it's pretty, you know, the sources suggest that that, that is uh, more myth than fact. And, you know, there are some, there, there is one uh, set of uh, reminiscences published in the 1870s full of wonderful stories. And I just had to say, I actually don't believe most of these. I can't put them in. Uh, I'll put in the ones where the uh, the witness, you know, was talking about stuff he himself saw. This was a, someone who later took orders, became a priest. I thought, okay, if you say you saw that, uh, I'll put it in my book. But if you just heard about that and no other source verifies it, and I have reason to believe it's not true, I'm not going to use your story. So, um, and there are similar things on the Protestant side. I mean, they had stories about, you know, this Catholic school supervisor coming in, looking at a Bible, not just saying don't teach it, actually throwing it out the window. I mean, you know, people just exaggerate wildly uh, in the 19th century. Um, great, great era for hoaxes, Edgar Allan Poe and all of those people. Right. All right. Well, thank you. This has been fantastic. And we have a link to Zach's book in the chat. So make sure you check that out. This is, again, a high level view of what was happening. And the book has lots of detail. Really, we'll get you in there and give you a good view of what was happening and, and what people were seeing and feeling as they were dealing with these riots. So check that out. Um, and next week, we will be speaking with A.J. Bain about Harry Truman's unexpected win in the 1948 presidential election. So that will be another good chat, and we hope that you'll join us. Thank you for joining us tonight, Zach, and thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Thank you.